point out that it's uh, it's a uh, uh, explanate, uh, I will try to explain this phenomena that uh, occurs. I, uh, so my research it's already ongoing because uh, we are in the middle of the pandemic, and this uh, when we talk about unemployment, it's really uh, related with social economic. Uh, causes and uh, here when I talk about Salvador, I will uh, I will finish in talking about the history of economics uh, in locality aspects. But the main point here that I try to briefly to to just to introduce uh, that the research aims to present the social and the economic effects of non-integration and precariousness of young people in Brazilian workforce since 2015 uh, uh, because uh, uh, International Labor Organization uh, released uh, one paper, one report in, in, the, uh, in that time telling us that the uh, our, uh, uh, such an warning about the unemployment and about some uh, effects that was caused, especially in Latin America, because the Brazilian rates and such uh, socioeconomic indicators was uh, really a warning. So now uh, I will present some data and I will try to understand with you guys too, because we need to map this phenomena. So it's a kind of uh, uh, introductive uh, research, and I really would like to have some uh, some opinions of you, uh, of all the group, to explore this, because uh, IBGE. Uh, Brazilian uh, Geographic and Statistics uh, Institution found uh, released some some data that I would like to present to make more specific for you. Let me tell you how can I share the screen. One minute. Fine. Yes, see? perfectly okay. fine, Bruna. Yes. So, what I would like to present here, it's basically uh, we will need these three basic assumptions to understand what I'm talking about. It's because when I'm talking about the young, I'm basically talking about early professionals. Because this is a, a, it's a kind of philo a philosophical approach too, because we need to understand work as a constitutive force of the social being. So here we need to understand that work isn't just an activity. Work is intrinsically related with existential aspects. So when we are talking about early professionals, when we are talking about youth, we need to understand that it's a, a in our uh, in our current societies uh, and civilizations, we tend to understand the youth as an intermediate moment between childhood and adulthood. So it's a constitutive. Uh, it's a constitutive moment and uh, especially to the young people it's important to have some uh, some security of economic re of their economic values uh, about the about the market because people tend to be um, how can I explain tend to be in the social life based on economic relations too. So we need to understand that uh, economic uh, economic aspects 
are really intrinsic and shape people, how people behave, how people tend to consume, how people tend to, to keep uh, relations like friendship, like uh, professional expectations. So when we are, when I'm trying to understand how unemployment will affect the youth, the youth people and the early professionals, I'm trying to understand how they can be integrated in the market because market here, it's a really a, a huge concept that we need to understand, to understand the social and economic dynamic. So uh, here too, we were, uh, we, I found uh, some aspects uh, related with precariousness of, say, of labor in Salvador. And it, it's, a uh, really complicated thing that shows some aspects that I, I will be introduced in a few moments. But for now, I would like you to keep this in mind that when I'm trying to, when I'm talking about youth, I'm talking about early professionals and there's a specific, in a specific group that will be determined by BGE, a Brazilian uh, Geographic and a statistic institution and I'm talking about uh, people in the in that group in the 18 years old 20, uh, to, to 24 years old so it's uh, what the, the specific literature shows uh, and like it's a moment between uh, uh, it's a moment, it's a really important moment because it's a moment that people can be integrated in the labor force. And the concept of labor force it's re and workforce too, it's really important because people normally in this period, they are trying to understand how can they can be, be how can they can be a solid professional? So the concerns about having a career uh, are really special in this moment. And when we are talking about the youth, we need to understand that it's a, a social aspects here, here too and philosophical aspects related to being youth. And now I think it's, uh, it's important to us to imagine how it was to be a, a teenager, like how it was to be a, an early professional, because it's a moment of such, an, uh, such a normally anxiety. And this is, could be, this is, this need to be a uh, sensibility to understand why we tend to have, why uh, national states tend to have a special political approach to youth. It's because a really an, a specific uh, group that need to have look at itself. I, I don't know if I, I, I was okay to point out the basic assumptions, but this, these three basic, uh, basic assumptions will be in my presentation. So I'm mapping here using the official concept of unemployment. And in Brazil, we tend to understand the concept of unemployment as people of working age who are not working, but are available and trying to find work. So here we have uh, 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 the data and we have the occupied ones, unoccupied, out of work and uh, lower uh, people under age to work. And the, and now we will try, I will try to, to show what I 
uh, um, really got me concerned with this data. It's, this is a updated official data now. Uh, the, the rates of, um, uh, um, of disoccupation uh, in Brazil, and now we have uh, the worst one, the Northwest. And in the Northwest, um, I will be, it will be located Salvador, Bahia. And now let me point out, Bahia here, it's a, a, a state in the Northwest that it's uh, one of the big ones and has a huge uh, demographic density and a huge territory. So, and it's, uh, it's our, when we look at to Brazilian history, it's one of the most uh, states related with the slavery. So in Bahia, we need to understand that our democratic approach when we are looking to people will be very intrinsic relate, uh, related with the slavery. So uh, the, official, uh, the official data that I'll present right now won't show those kinds of shades. And this is how I'm trying to emphasize in the title of my, uh, my research, because here we will see the series historicas, history uh, uh, moments to understand social and economic uh, relations uh, of unemployment. And this is the rate of mis uh, of misoccupation. And I would like you to look at so these moments of inflection here because we will have a boom of unemployment. And this point, it will be here too, when we explore, when we will explore the data. And OIT uh, really got concerned in that, that time about the unemployment in Brazil and about, spe uh, specifically about the the disregulation uh, of a workforce uh, lack of protections to the labor. And when we are exploring this data, we can see that uh, when we are talking about unemployment, it will be very intrinsic related with the age. And now when we, uh, Consider that we are trying to understand it, this phenomena, looking to the youth, to the early professionals. We need to look, at spe especially here. So in this time, when we saw the, the inflection, we saw how the youth will be affected and how this in this moment will be uh, will be in a specific uh, consolidation of unemployment for the youth to the period and tends to continue and it's really an updated data set that I'm present to you guys and got me really concerned and uh, looking to the to the gender and is to understand that this is one of the uh, unfortunately it's a, a gender phenomena too because it tends to be worse to human and when we look to human it's really a concern because this is a quantitative approach but here we need to remember that when we are trying to, to put this data in uh, concrete terms, who will be this, uh, this human? And this is won't be explored. Those kind of shades needs to be 
uh, here too. We need to understand that we need to make this qualitative uh, uh, qualitative approach and the literature uh, th talks about to and here when we look to Salvador located here in, ba in Bahia consider the, the aspects of slavery that for uh, that are really intrinsic of this these problems in this the phenomena we need to understand that when we are exploring this data, data set, we need to explore in the criteria that, that, to understand that these data are really, uh, are really um, in a really, um, how can I explain? It's a, such a initial moment. So won't, these rates won't get lower without special uh, specified policies to handle it because the when uh, and now I, I will show some video to make you understand how the dynamic of Salvador will shape the way this unemployment will be expressed because I don't know if uh, if you already was at Salvador, so when I'm talk I'm talking about the early professionals in Salvador society, I need to talk about the cultural expressions of unemployment, and this is it's really huge because we have a, a society that tends to be more informal and. Uh, all the literature, the, uh, the specific literature that I already find it uh, uh, explains this, that our, we have uh, intrinsic problems here because we have unemployment of young, uh, young people, of early professionals that uh, won't be uh, at, uh, integrated in the workforce, won't be uh, stable in the social and economic period that should be and in a it in a, a society that tends to punish some groups instead of others so here it's all it's i'm trying to understand how this is how this will be uh, expressed expressed to human and to and to black people and to make you understand that all the literature that I already find tells us that uh, the slavery it's a problem that continues to manifest in uh, Soteropolitan society, uh, uh, society because uh, colonialism will be very intrinsic uh, in these relations and I'm trying to understand a dynamic I'm trying to understand how the young people will be uh, in, uh, will be in the individual relations considered that such a uh, an, uh, uh, a society that tends to punish some groups and uh, looking to the the history to the lab, uh, to the market to market in Salvador, we understand that isn't a, a solid market. Tends to be forced uh, for a unf a informality of labor vehicles, and people tend to be in out of formal economy and this is a, a really huge problem because it manifests uh, in the in the labor markets that tends to be always uh, in the flow of some crisis a global crisis 
So now um, I would like to present Una, some... 20 minutes already. Five? Tw you have already 20 minutes, so you, 10 minutes remaining if, if you want to okay, have okay. an answer. I will, I will show some video and it's really an old one, but I would like you to look at to relations between people and how the, the infrastructure will be present to understand that so, thousands of things will be uh, really, let me, okay. Will be present here. And I would like to explore these questions with you. Can you look? No, are you trying to show a video? The video is not showing. I think you need to cancel the, the other screen. Okay. We, we, we can still see your PowerPoint, but not the video. What you need to do, let me stop. You need to stop sharing the, um, the PowerPoint and then switch to the video. Yes, perfect. And now select the video. Like if you share the PowerPoint before, select the video now rather than the PowerPoint. Yes, it's working. It's working now, Bruna, yes. Can you look at We cannot hear the sound. Can you? We can see the video. We can see the video. We cannot hear the sound. Uh, could you try, Guilherme? I will send it to you. Yeah, of course. I, I'm just a little bit worried about the time because uh, we have okay. 30 minutes. So, and, uh, so we it will be only with seven minutes for questions and answers right now. Yeah, we, we are running okay. out of time. Okay, I'll, so try, uh, I would like you to try to understand uh, to look to relations here. Bruna, if you want to have one more minute to, you know, to finish with your conclusion, because that would leave us five minutes to ask you questions. If not, we are going to run out of time. Okay, fine. It's uh, the main ideas around this research. It's trying to map uh, these forces, these social and economic forces that trying to be so, uh, so decisive to some people to continue to be alive. So when we, we need to understand that this phenomena of unemployment, it's really decisive to these uh, to young people. 
because we have uh, the psychological aspects of unemployment. We have uh, the, the body protections, uh, considering that those people will be really, really related to violence because this is a, a society that really uh, really needs to be handled with specific politics to to put us the the young people in uh, uh, to use such a vitality to to good aspects to develop itself and it's basically this and I really would like to to counting uh, with uh, with you guys your contributions so i'm really really satisfied to to share these concerns with you perfect thank you very much uh, bruna obrigado and now we have five minutes exactly for questions and answers if i can have your questions in the meantime i'm going to start with um with probably um, comments slash question, uh, Bruna, um, I'm very familiar with what you describe. It's the northeast of uh, Brazil, and right down at the bottom of the northeast, we have Rio de Janeiro and the central, you know, area, including Pedra de Guarachiba. And what you're describing and the images you show are very similar to my experience in Pedra de Guarachiba. So my question to you. You mentioned many interesting things, but my question to you, in particular, working class unemployment, um, you mentioned uh, two groups, uh, women and black people. We have the same problem at Pedra de Guarachiba, uh, women and black uh, people in particular. Um, have you found any particular reasons to, for them to be uh, the target of such discrimination in Brazil? I, I, I have my own research here, but I'd like to, you know, to, to, to tell us whether you you've, uh, have any information about women and black, uh, you know, people in Brazil in terms of unemployment. Uh, considering unemployment as a dynamic, uh, looking to human specific, uh, I can, we can be related with domestic domestic and gender expectations for humans so when we uh, when we in the in the moment of unemployment human uh, the all the literature that I already look at uh, emphasize this the human tends to be the the main group out moved out of work and formal workforce because they, uh, because the way they shape uh, their lives and society shape their lives tends to understand that in the crisis moment, humans and black people can be in the informality or can be used to uh, domestic labors and non-paid, non-paid uh, labors. So it's. Uh, it's a kind of social interpretation of where this this subject should be. Thank you very much, Runa. I don't know if we have any other question from any other person here. One thing, social interpretation, linked to that, uh, you mentioned before colonialism. But I believe that happens, that's why social interpretation is so important. We still have a Latin America colonialism of a different kind, not neo-colonialism, mindset colonialism. We've been embedded, you know, through our education, primary, secondary school, to follow European or US style of thinking. And we have to pay attention to their authors and their research and the results of their research. In, in relation to our people. I think it's high time for Latin Americans to start producing our own uh, results, our own products, and people like you are, are, are key in making these changes. Because it's not colonialism or neo-colonialism, it's colonialism in the mind, mindset colonialism, what you call social interpretation. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, uh, I think we are okay with that. We have one more minute. Any other uh, comment or question? People are asking me here um, whether you would be happy, you know, the chat box, if you can share the video, because, you know, they, they wanted to see the video, but for, for probably okay. the, the Wi-Fi connection. 
uh, some were not able to, to, to appreciate properly the video. If that's okay, you know the chat, simply copy and paste the link. And Guilherme, I think that's okay, no? Because she can share then the PowerPoint as well. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Perfect, okay. Well, obrigado, Bruna. Thank you. A pleasure, thank you very much. Now we are going to go um, to our second presenter. Uh, right now, again, we had a cancellation, so we're going to go right now to Douglas. Are you there, Douglas? Yeah, perfect, yes. My friend Douglas from Brazil. I'll do the proper presentation, Douglas. We have Douglas de Castro from Ambra University, US, and the Getulio uh, Vargas Foundation, or Fundação, in Brazil. Uh, Douglas will be talking about linking national to international politics, China's contribution to the no poverty and zero hunger UN sustainable development goals. Uh, without anything else from me, uh, Douglas, are you ready? Yes, Jorge, I'm Perfect. ready. <laughs> Benvindo, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's nice to see many familiar faces uh, here. Uh, Bruna, thank, thanks for uh, your presentation. I really uh, enjoyed uh, the presentation. Uh, let me share uh, my screen uh, with you. <clears throat> Can you see my presentation? Yes, perfectly well. Okay, perfect, perfect. Well, uh, this is... Um, this is a, uh, a study that um, uh, it, it's part of a broader uh, research agenda uh, in, which we, in which we work at uh, uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas, the School of Law, in which we investigate the role of uh, law in the international or in, in the economic relations between uh, China and Brazil. So the, uh, this is a uh, paper that is, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, is, it is related to, to that. Uh, so the idea of the, of the paper, and here I, I briefly uh, point out the structure of the paper to you. Uh, the first main uh, topic uh, is going to be to talk about uh, food security in, in, in China in, in order to understand uh, internal uh, pressures and uh, potential uh, solutions uh, to that. Uh, the third part will uh, analyze the international spillover of the socialism with uh, Chinese characteristics. Um, and um, the basic idea here is to operationalize, op, uh, to, to make the opera, operationalization of the, what I call uh, in other uh, stances, I'm going to show to you one of the papers that I, I wrote in which I, I call it the Bandung spirit uh, in seeking food security. And then uh, to talk about the Beijing consensus in opposition to the Washington consensus uh, and the sustainable uh, UN sustainable De development goals and, uh, and how the Beijing consensus uh, can uh, uh, bring to international uh, community a new uh, form or uh, other aspects uh, towards uh, sustainability. Uh, well, the, the theoretical approach uh, in my paper, in, and uh, especially uh, uh, the other, the last three, are very present in other uh, works that I've been I've been doing. Uh, and in this uh, special uh, paper, I'm I'm incorporating the two-level game because I'm talking about the linkage between. And national and uh, international politics. So the two-level game is 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 very um, necessary to understand the interplay uh, between uh, between those uh, stances. Uh, as such, domestic politics and international relations are often in, in inextricably entangled 
but existing theory, particularly state-centric uh, theories, uh, do not adequately account for uh, these linkages. And, and this is how uh, I tend to uh, contribute uh, in this, uh, in this uh, paper. Uh, the other aspect or theoretical aspect, uh, it is uh, constructivism. Uh, it is uh, part of the mainstream uh, theories of international relations. I should say uh, it's not the, the uh, it's not in the first or second place because uh, realism and uh, liberalism uh, are two competing mainstream theories. But uh, uh, in order to understand the relationships between uh, global South countries, we need to look into or beyond material uh, capabilities of the states. I'm, I'm not saying that they are not present in the that material capabilities are not important, but due to the same experiences that those countries uh, lived, especially with the encounter with European powers, uh, share ideas and experiences are very uh, important and play a, 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 an important and bring uh, important implications uh, to their uh, relationship. And especially when uh, talking about uh, uh, China, it's easy to engage in discussions uh, of China being or seeking to be a, 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 a power, an imperial power, or merely doing uh, in the global south scenario, uh, doing a, some sort of a sub-imperial venture or a new colonialism uh, venture. So, looking into constructivism brings not only the uh, uh, the awareness of the material capabilities but also as important as uh, the shared ideas and experiences uh, that we we all uh, global south countries uh, uh, experience in the encounter with Europe, especially european uh, powers uh, the other one is the Bandung spirit, as I mentioned uh, before. I already uh, draw some uh, uh, in, in operational, op uh, uh, broad operas operationalization of the uh, of this uh, uh, this term, uh, which is basically. Uh, a derivative of the uh, the Bandung conference. Uh, in the 50s in which uh, countries, um, uh, the, the 22 or 23, I, I don't recollect right now, uh, South uh, countries uh, uh, presented a uh, post-colonial uh, solidarity opposing uh, liberalization, privatization and deregulation. Um, I put it here to you as a reference, uh, the uh, recent paper that I published in Beijing Law Review, uh, Economic Relationship Between Brazil and China, an Empirical Assessment Using Sentiment and Content Analysis, in which I, uh, I uh, look into the, those um, instruments and uh, narratives between uh, the two countries and the narratives between uh, those countries and with the developed countries to see and, and to measure negativity or positivity in the terms used in uh, treaties and conventions and other communications. And um, uh, it showed that uh, there's a uh, more closer, especially in the, in the official uh, narratives, a more close connection and a more positive uh, use of terms when uh, when we are communicating with uh, with uh, uh, among uh, uh, global South countries. And the other the other <clears throat> theoretical aspect uh, it is uh, the failure failure of the current uh, food system. Um, as we know, uh, Brazil, especially Brazil, is a, uh, a country uh, that um, 
specializes in uh, commodity uh, exportation. And um, well, that's the problem because the, uh, the more we produce uh, food, uh, the more we tend to um, we tend to uh, uh, cause negative effects in biodiversity. The more we need uh, we we uh, we um, uh, pressure or negative pressures on uh, global climate change because we have to export long distances and and so forth and. Uh, the output of food is not related to decreasing hunger, hunger in, in the world. And especially for us, uh, to Brazil, it's, uh, it's, a, uh, it's very problematic because in economic terms, we are seeing, uh, we're seeing a very uh, uh, dependence on, on uh, agriculture. Uh, it, it, sustain, it, it has sustained our GDP for uh, for years, but all the externalities are here. And, um, and of course, uh, 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 we're looking into, into this uh, relationship. And, and, and this is, um, of course, the subject of another uh, paper I've been uh, working, uh, which is the, the role of uh, uh, the Brazilian relationship with, with uh, China in terms of uh, uh, climate change. And uh, I tend to look into a uh, coupling, a coupling approach between them. Uh, and that's why I refuse, uh, I refuse the, uh, the imperial or sub-imperial claim that many uh, made because uh, Brazil is a, a commodity exportation, ex exporting country and China needs food. So there's, there's what I call in this paper, a coupling uh, of interest, interests and not one country trying to subject the other to uh, its power or its uh, domination, even subtle uh, domination. Uh, in order to conduct my analysis, I looked into um, epistemic uh, communities and to see how uh, how the uh, 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 decreasing hunger and how um, uh, uh, climate change is related and, and uh, how the SDG uh, uh, goals are uh, interconnected, and, uh, and, and uh, it's 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 a very concerning, and this is part of the exploratory analysis that I'm doing in my paper, uh, in which uh, the uh, uh, the epistemic community, uh, uh, in of course, in, until 2010, we tend to see uh, terms like rice, climate change bioenergy and uh, energy sustainability and other terms used in more than uh, 900 papers that I, I collected and uh, related to. Until 2010, it does make sense because we were, we were very close to the global food uh, uh, crisis in 2008, so it was very important. Uh, 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 themes like uh, hunger, uh, uh, food security, and, and even climate change were, were very connected. And uh, as you can see here, from 2015 and 2020, uh, we see a decrease of the epistemic community looking into those, um, uh, those terms and researching the linkage between, between them. So it's a uh, it's part of the uh, what I'm trying to to understand globally uh, why this is this is happening and why China is a good contributor for uh, for uh, for this uh, this problem that I've been uh, observing. So uh, looking into China, uh, it's a uh, it's a country that's uh, 
especially uh, the government in, in, in looking into the uh, international uh, relations. It is a, a country that uh, it's looking into, at least from what I've been uh, researching, uh, to avoid the zero-sum game and uh, the win-or-lose mentality, which is very compatible with, uh, uh, with the constructivism. Uh, looking into a new type of international cooperation and, and exchange, uh, even though many don't understand uh, how this is uh, going to, uh, to play. And I expect in this, uh, with, within this uh, uh, section in uh, the, the, the food security, I, I, I plan to, uh, to analyze that. Uh, domestic actions towards uh, SG, SDGs. Uh, of course, the numbers when we talk to uh, talk about China, all the numbers are very staggering, right? So uh, just by decreasing uh, poverty in uh, in China, the contribution to the global poverty reduction was seventy percent. So uh, we see a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, a great contribution, uh, even though. Uh, we, we need to look into the grandiosity of, uh, of China in all the numbers that they uh, present. And looking into the Beijing consensus as an alternative to the system that has been, uh, has been able neither to eradicate hunger uh, nor poverty. And the basic assumptions to the um, Beijing consensus that I'm, I'm drawing uh, is the desire to have an equitable, peaceable, uh, peaceful, high quality growth, um, does not believe in uniform solutions for every situation, and much about social change as the economic change. So uh, this, is, this is what I've been, uh, I've been looking into and trying to uh, make sense uh, in this uh, research. Uh, so I have, uh, I presented my, uh, my sketch in uh, 16 minutes. So uh, thank you so much and uh, we can go uh, for the questions. Perfect, thank you very much uh, Douglas, uh, very nice. Can I ask you to cancel the, um, the share screen? Sure. Can see Perfect, thank you very much. Um, so, do we have any questions? I can see Daniela here. Um, I'm going to drop some something here. You mentioned, and I'm letting the others have time to think about the question. You mentioned a two-level game, and to me, I agree with you know with your analysis first of all. But to me, it's not a two-level game. We are missing a third part. You know, to me, it's a, I talk about context, not level. You mentioned the domestic. You mentioned the international. But I think you are missing the regional. Why? Because um, actors like the US, actors like China, actors like Russia tend to use um, our countries in Latin America to play against, against the region. Uh, so sometimes it may be Chile against Argentina for the Falklands. Sometimes it may be supporting Mexico against the uh, interest in the Amazonia for multinationals and so on. So I, I wonder if you consider the regional, because I think regionally we have the answer for you know, many of our problems, you know, acting as a region gives us a much stronger position. Uh, and you mentioned many examples. I'm thinking of, you know, the food system, you know, the ones you mentioned. So I wonder if you've um, included or you are planning to include the regional element in your analysis. Uh, well, Georgie, I'm, I'm considering the, I'm looking into the, uh, um, to the regional uh, uh, side as, as well. Um, the, and, and, and of course, I agree uh, with you. Uh, and, and I personally, I, I uh, defend that uh, uh, most of the problems, especially uh, environmental problems that we're facing, uh, we, can, uh, we, 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 have, uh, we can achieve a more uh, sustainable and effective uh, uh, responses by uh, addressing those uh, issues regionally, rather than going global and uh, start uh, or or to be engaged in uh, endless uh, negotiations. Uh, 
Um, uh, so yes, I'm, I'm, I'm looking into the regional, uh, the regional uh, aspect. Um, the, the, the problem with the uh, two-level game uh, theory is that it, it looks only uh, uh, national uh, to international level in the interplay. Uh, some authors, they include the regional uh, uh, aspect in the international one. Uh, so if you're looking into the international, you're looking that, That's into why I was asking, because to me that's an incomplete vision and usually bias. Yeah. There is an intention, the bias, because that vision, international and regional, comes from the US, from the UK, and there is an intention there behind. Mm -hmm. So they neglect our regions, uh, because our regions have an important influence within, you know, mm -hmm. so that's why they tend to absorb the region within the international. It gives them and their speeches in, in politics and law more power. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And uh, some of them, uh, some of them even, uh, even look into the, well, uh, I'm looking into uh, the China contribution, so I'm looking into the, uh, the national level and how this goes to the international level. Uh, and eventually uh, the effects in, uh, in the regional level will be considered as a spillover effect in, into the, the regional effect. So uh, yes, yes, I'm considering, uh, I'm considering for sure the regional one and I'm trying to figure out uh, how to, uh, to address that. Thank you, Douglas. We have a question here from Nayana, and again, in the meantime, any other, you know, who has a question, please write it down. Uh, China was supposed to eradicate extreme poverty in 2020, uh, Nayana is asking. In pandemic times, this target seems to be not very feasible. I couldn't agree more. Um, so this serious uh, hunger game as well, you know. Douglas, what is your opinion about it? Um, Well, uh, I I agree with you. I mean, in terms of uh, in terms of the achieving by uh, uh, 2020 the the goal, but uh, what we can uh, we can see is uh, uh, um, an important increment in um, in, in uh, food importations by uh, by China. Including, including uh, as I, I mentioned already, uh, the uh, the relationship between China and Brazil, and uh, we can see that uh, uh, China is really sustaining uh, the uh, the le importation levels, uh, uh, the exportation levels uh, from uh, from uh, for Brazil. So, yeah, I, I agree that it, it won't happen. Uh, but I would say that um, uh, that the China is uh, uh, um, even with the pandemic, uh, the the country is 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 uh, fulfilling their uh, uh, its commitment to uh, to increase uh, quality of life of its citizens. Of course, of course, there's there's a lot of uh, side talk that we can talk about here about uh, other aspects of, of China uh, that are very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, conflicting. But uh, from what I've been uh, seeing in the, in the project, and, uh, and this is going to be also, I forgot to mention, it's going to be a, 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 the, a research object uh, for the next year in a visiting uh, professorship, I'm going to be in Lanzhou University in the Silk Road, uh, Silk Road Center uh, to uh, research more about, uh, about that. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if we have any question, but in the meantime, something I wanted to ask or highlight, a coincidence between Bruna and you, one of your headings or subheadings using sentiment and content analysis. I wonder what you meant by sentiment there because it find it very, it's just a concept very similar to Bruna's social interpretation. So what do you mean there using sentiment? 
and content analysis. If you can explain us a bit more. Sure, sure. Well, uh, what I'm, I'm, I'm doing in terms of sentiment analysis, I'm bringing from, uh, from the marketing, uh, marketing uh, 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 study designs in order to measure uh, the satisfaction or dissatisfaction of, uh, of consumers with products. Uh, by using a, a lexicon uh, produced in, in, in Oxford with more than 5,000 terms with uh, negative aspects and 6,000 with positive uh, uh, aspects. Um, and, and then uh, uh, taking those uh, uh, um, uh, treaties, conventions, uh, official declarations, uh, media, media output, and running tests to measure the positivity or negativity or neutrality in those uh, in those uh, documents. Right? It's uh, it's. Uh, I uh, frankly I, I I don't see anyone doing that in law or or international relations. I see that in, in, uh, in as I said, starting with the marketing, uh, business management and other related topics, but not in, um, but not in uh, international relations and, and especially international, international law. And uh, what I'm, I'm, I, I did, it, I, I, um, I created a, uh, an application within uh, Python, which is a programmer's language, uh, to run the tests of, uh, to run the sentiment analysis, uh, to measure uh, what is the positivity, negativity, or neutrality of, uh, of, that, uh, of that document. Uh, if it helps, Douglas, because we still have a bit of time, uh, three more minutes, just to add. Yeah, there is research, not in particular, you know, to global justice and um, um, linguistics. It comes from linguistics in international sure. relations. I use it for my chapter, my last book, chapter six, about the Americas, uh, how the negative versus positive interpretation between the UK, British uh, people mm -hmm. and Argentina in terms of the folk clans. So the kind of analysis is very similar. That's why I see a coincidence and it was interesting, you know, you, Bruna and myself to talk mm -hmm. about this because it has to do at the individual level, social interpretation, black people, women, and so on, certain sectors, and what mm -hmm. I call a mindset colonialism. And what sure. you're describing in international relations, because it has to do with the lexicon, the, 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 the way in which certain terms are being used by certain communities or people, or leaders as well, in order to get a result. And uh, there is a study already, uh, international relations, linguistics. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh -huh. Yeah, good, good. And, yeah, and, and also this the, the sentiment analysis, I, I, I did it as more a, as a, an exploratory uh, 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 study in order to, to see the positivity or negativity of the terms and then go into a content analysis to uh, to operationalize uh, the uh, the the terms and see how the terms are connected more or less with others and uh, and uh, a more deep analysis of the of the lexicon uh, or, or the term in itself. Perfect. Thank you very much. Any, any other last question? We have one more minute with Douglas, if you may want to ask anything. If not, we can go. Thank you very much, Douglas. Obrigado. You're welcome. As well. Thank you. Uh, we have now our third paper here, and I can see Daniela and Rodrigo. So I'm going to introduce you both. We have uh, Daniela Getliner and Rodrigo Mindin Loeb from Mackenzie Presbyterian University, Brazil, in Sao Paulo. Um, and we are going to talk uh, about a Moinho Community Childhood a Context Analysis. Um, so without anything else for me to say, I don't know if it's going to be uh, Daniela or Rodrigo to start. Welcome, uh, and the floor is yours. Again, roughly 20 minutes, and then we'll follow with questions and answers. Ah, yeah, Rodrigo, I can see Rodrigo. Thank you, Rodrigo. Obrigado. Okay, 
Thank you so much, Jorge. We are here. We are glad to be here. Uh, me and Daniela are architecture and urbanism uh, teachers at Mackenzie University. And we wish to talk about uh, some experience we uh, have been doing with students uh, in the territory of Favela do Moinho, which is uh, a slum located in the center of the city of Sao Paulo, and address childhood conditions of life in these urban areas of uh, extreme multidimensional vulnerability and the need for intervention uh, with some regenerative strategies in informal territories to improve development of early childhood and to do so uh, in a more uh, adequate and broad understanding and we uh, state that it is necessary uh, to have an active and interactive experience with the community, in and with the community, uh, to identify local knowledge and build a diagnostic with a participatory process. So, uh, the community of Moinho, let me see, is located in downtown in the city of Sao Paulo, uh, in the context of Brazil. So 35.6 of Brazilian counties were classified as territories of multidimensional vulnerability in 2010. And today, 40,9% of Brazilians are living in low, extremely low and precarious conditions. So in the city of Sao Paulo, this map shows the index of social vulnerability, uh, and it's concentrated in the outskirts. However, in the center of the city, in the more infrastructure areas, we can find these islands of poverty and extreme vulnerability, even uh, if they are in an area very infrastructured with uh, work opportunities, but they still don't have the rights and the conditions of life we would consider adequate. Uh, and this in the context that, according to IPEA, the Institute of Economic Research of Brazil, today we have 50 million people living in poverty with less than $5.5 a day. And it's expected to achieve two thirds of the total population by uh, 2030, or approximately 160 million people that will be uh, in a condition of poverty and living in very vulnerable areas in the cities. Brazil is a very uh, urban uh, country. More than 85% of Brazilian population occupy uh, urban territories. And these uh, counties are in vulnerable conditions. Sao Paulo is the third, uh, is one of the largest cities in the world and 75% of its citizens lives under inadequate life conditions with some kind of lack of services and access to uh, environmental services and, and life conditions. So the favela do Moinho is located between the two lines of uh, public transport, metropolitan transport, the train. These lines were used as part of the infrastructure to uh, transport the grains of uh, production and, and, and the area had mills to, to work with that and with the change of the mode of transport these areas were abandoned by the companies that generated uh, this income and they were occupied uh, by people that did not have a place to leave. And so now Daniela will talk about uh, the territory. This is the entrance of the Moinho slum. It has a single access connection to the city and uh, with a fragile and, and dangerous situation because the train has to go through 
and people have to wait and, and so accidents may happen and it's under the viaduct uh, and it's not a very nice access but is the access that people have to get to the community and the railroad line isolates the slum area separating formal and informal territories in a very strict way and inside from the inside we see uh, the middle class apartment buildings of the neighborhood uh, and we clearly see the formal city uh, in relation to the informal territory in the shacks of the Moinho community. So people occupy in the way they can. This is a, a local cultural center that they use to show movies and the condition of the children in this territory. And then Daniela will talk about the activity with the students of uh, Mackenzie School of Architecture, which was uh, had the purpose to approach the reality that is so close in terms of uh, uh, physical distance uh, uh, and so distant in terms of uh, reality. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this activity, uh, Rodrigo and I, we've been doing for a couple of uh, semesters by now. And the reason we decided we chose this particular slum, it's because it's walking distance from our school. So although it's only two kilometers apart from our campus, we realize that most of our students have never been inside a community. So for these kids, this is their first experience entering to this kind of territories of very uh, strong deficiencies in terms of uh, infrastructure comparing to the, to the neighborhoods uh, around it. So uh, this facility we are visiting is the NGO uh, building that uh, takes care of children when they're not at school. So uh, in order to make the uh, diagnosis of this favela, as well as to advance the understanding of the challenges imposed, we decided to, first of all, to get to know the children. So this is the first approach where we decided to uh, include playing activities so that our students could uh, meet the children and get their confidence and extract from them their perceptions from their environment where they live. So this is the first round of activities. We were asking the children how they see their community what is what their favorite places to play, what kind of games they play, how they get along, if they are able to walk separately or uh, in small groups, how safe they feel inside their community and so forth, so on. So uh, we took some aerial photographs and asked them to point their favorite places to explain. And we were very impressed to see how fast they understood they could point on the map where they were, where they lived, and they had so much to talk about their gated community because it's, this is a totally separated, isolated area inside the city. Please, hold on. After this first approach using the maps, uh, the, the children took us on a guided tour through the community and they had so much to talk. They wanted to show their houses. They wanted to show their place, their favorite places inside the community. They also told us, uh, they showed where they play. Actually, they play in the ruins of the old factory that used to work in this neighborhood. And also they pointed us some places where they're not allowed because it's a very uh, controlled territory by the local drug dealers. But children, they, play everywhere. They played with anything. Let's move on. So next we took some photographs, we printed them out and asked them to draw, to show us how they would dream that this place could look like. So how would you like our community to look like? So this is basically the entrance into the favela and this boy is showing us that he, he chose this particular uh, picture to draw on. 
So this is the activity our students uh, were just helping the children, trying to uh, asking them to uh, dream and not, not only uh, to express themselves through words or through drawings because we did this activity with children from uh, with different ages and also to draw what they would like to have in the particular areas the pointed the the empty spots so basically the boys they just wanted a soccer field and the girls wanted some other places to play let's move on so after that, we did a little exposition of the work. So the children, they were pointing and they were saying here in the community, there would be a playground, lots of greenery, soccer field, and a swimming pool, a shopping mall, whatever they can think of. But basically, we were able to uh, put together the information that they, they wanted a soccer field but also a place where the girls could play. So they, the girls wanted to make sure that the soccer field would not belong only to, to the men of the community and not only to the boys. But, well, after that, uh, the next day we came back and we decided to uh, take measurements of this, soccer, this empty space in order to really design a soccer field for the community. So the children, they helped us taking measurements and also drawing. So we had this activity of uh, how to represent what you are measuring. Well, after that, back in the school, we developed the court project with our students all the construction drawings, also cost estimation, and all the documents necessary, all the architecture drawings necessary to build the soccer field for the community. So this is just a, a pre preliminary draft of how the soccer would look like in terms of technical drawing. Also the first images our students developed just to give the community an, an idea of what this place could look like. Next. And finally, we had this conversation with our students from McKenzie uh, School of Architecture and Urbanism to understand what it meant to them uh, in terms of uh, develop of their uh, perceptions of this first contact with this reality that is so close to all, all of us that live in Sao Paulo or all Brazilians and yet so apart from our daily uh, routine of just dealing with these different uh, people in terms of uh, daily life but that are, live so close to us and desperately in need of uh, changing their environment. So basically, we conclude that the urgency of effective transformation in areas of great social vulnerability can be translated into the need to include in the training and qualification of architects and urban professionals, multi and transdisciplinary skills and abilities to work in vulnerable territories, as well as in-depth cultural knowledge in matters such as gender and early childhood, combined with technical and theoretical training in the specific field of the profession. And here, I think we conclude our presentation. I don't know how long we took, but we are just open for uh, questions and comments. Perfect. Obrigado, Daniela and Rodrigo. Very, very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. We have a bit more than 10 minutes for questions and answers. So I don't know if people have a question. Uh, can we uh, cancel the share, Daniela or Rodrigo? Sure. Thank Perfect. Thank you. Obrigado. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank uh, I'm going to start breaking the ice. I found your presentation beautiful, both of, uh, of you. Um, just to show you, I work in uh, Fundação Angelica Goulart, and what you're showing, look at the picture from our children there. And, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, one Great. thing, one idea, you know, maybe uh, I like the... Um, and the question will be about multidimensional vulnerabilities because I couldn't agree more with that concept, multidimensional vulnerabilities. But you know, talking about uh, Daniela's last part, um, bringing your students there, bringing the students to the favela, you know, that's exactly what we do and what I do. I go to Copacabana and I move myself to Pedra de Guarachiva and I 
stay asleep there. Because I think we, in order to uh, work with poverty, you have to live with poverty. And that's why, why your work is uh, beautiful. And you know, probably to take on board um, from organizations trying to work with local people and local foundations, a local, a local. So McKenzie has the staff, has the knowledge, and has the students, has the, the financial resources. Maybe reaching out. Uh, as an example, you know, we have programs with like Meninas Empoderadas or Corda Pedra. So we use our teenagers from Pedra de Guarativa, we empower them, and they work with the community. So although we psychologists, sociologists, and so on, the idea is for them to grow as well and uh, to grow with the community. So you know, quite a lot to talk from me with Daniela Rodrigo because I found your presentation very interesting for many reasons. So my question to you would be, Daniela and Rodrigo, uh, from your research and from your field work, what do you mean by multidimensional vulnerabilities? I think I get the idea, but I'd like you to expand on that. Okay. Thank you, Jorge. Very, very nice uh, point. Very nice question. Well, first of all, I think that uh, this kind of uh, intervention and work should be uh, considering to include five instances of uh, action of, of actors, no? stakeholders, where the university is one of them, the community is another, uh, the public sector is one very important. The private initiative is indeed somebody that should be involved, not only in terms of funding, but also in terms of their uh, presence in the, in the territories. And finally, the, so the organizations of uh, social uh, civil organizations, no non-governmental organizations that one of them is there. So in this in this particular action, we uh, were involving community, a social organization, and the university, and and I think that they need to uh, we need to include the other stakeholders in order to really uh, have an impact to change this condition of multidimensional vulnerability. Then now I come to your point uh, is where uh, you have several levels of uh, vulnerable conditions. We have uh, economic vulnerability, people don't have income, regular income, they have low income conditions and not regular, so they... I think Daniela is struggling ...struggle to uh, maintain in income to, to live. Then they have uh, environmental vulnerability. The territory they live uh, don't have uh, sewage, uh, uh, adequate sewage. Uh, water supply many times is not available. They have to to make their own uh, solution. They are vulnerable in terms of uh, property. They don't have uh, the the right of the land and the property assured because it's an occupation. Uh, so and so on. So this uh, this is what I mean. By, we mean by multidimensional vulnerability. So we have many levels of vulnerability and they interact. One uh, uh, makes an uh, impact over the other. So uh, it is the way to interact and to intervene should be uh, through transdisciplinary. Completely you know? agree, Rodrigo, completely agree. That, that's the, the, the general. Idea. It's a very complex problem. We need a complex solution in the sense we need, especially from different areas, sociologists, psychologists, lawyers, and so on. Yes, Com I couldn't agree more. Daniela, yeah. I don't know if you want to add anything? Well, I would just like to say that 10% um, of all we do in our, in, in our school is supposed to be extension activities. So uh, some teachers, including uh, Rodrigo and myself, we believe that if we are supposed to do something that it's for the community, why don't we look into the, the, the places where we are needed mostly? So uh, we have all this idea of training students and showing them, not only showing them a, a different reality, but also showing the importance of uh, really being present in this kind of communities. Uh, the, I totally agree with you that the only way we can start changing the, the reality of these communities is by 
getting in touch with them. They have a lot to teach us in terms of their territory. They, they really, they have lots of inputs. Uh, the idea of coming with a final project, like a top-down decision, Completely. proven not to bottom work. Top-down yeah, decision, bottom up. Bottom exactly. Up. Yeah, it has to be bottom up so we have to work with them. In this particular uh, activity we did with the children, yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, totally. But I look, I think like this. We have teenagers from the foundation now teaching about this. Teenagers from very humble background, very poor background, from Pedra de Guarativa, teaching other teenagers about uh, Novata Eduque. Uh-huh, very interesting. Well, just uh, as you mentioned, uh, we were very impressed how aggressive these children they were with themselves and with us in the beginning. They, 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 they don't even, the, the small children, they argue on everything. So basically first in the play activity we have, we had to teach them, hey, you have to raise your hand, you have to wait for your time, you're gonna have the opportunity to express yourself and things like that, like basic things. So you understand from this uh, contact with the children that they are under a lot of pressure from their environment where they live, the families, where, they, where people they live. So basically we believe that uh, the way to transform the reality of the whole community is by dealing, starting with the children. So the children can show the parents a different reality and can, you know, you start really to improve the quality of life of the whole community, starting very small, starting with little. I, I couldn't agree to... more. I couldn't agree more. Our children from the now Bata Eduque are uh, drawing posters to teach parents how to treat them. Yeah. You know, how not to That's talk true. to them in a certain way, how to deal with, yes, I couldn't agree more, Daniela. Any, I don't want to take any other questions or comments, please, from the audience, because this is a very interesting presentation. Any other? No, I don't know if uh, Rodrigo or Daniela want to say something else. Uh, we still have a few more minutes before we move to the next presentation. I know Rodrigo is part of the next presentation, but <laughs> yeah. I was just asking. It's okay. No, thank you. No, just add uh, the, the final remark that uh, one thing that is uh, very uh, challenging for us is the continuity of these actions because we have a few semesters where we have the activity. Then how do we follow up with that? How do we continue? And if I may don't... add, um, I cannot share all the information, but when Shusha had to step down because she was forced to step down from the foundation, mm -hmm. people like I decided to put their time. Uh, I traveled myself to Brazil, I paid myself the tickets every time I go, uh, and I, I don't think it's wishful thinking. I think it's part of us paying back to our countries. In my case, again, I'm Latin American, first then I'm Argentinian, and I'm mm -hmm. not better than anybody else. That's to me, we shouldn't rely of, uh, on our government, whether Bolsonaro or Donald Trump. And I'm not complaining about them. To me, it's up to us to make the change. If we keep on waiting, the change will never happen. And it's up to, Daniela mentioned something very key. It is up to us to empower our children to start the movement. Yeah. And yeah. I don't think this is wishful thinking, because if not, mm -hmm. we will have people talking from London, New York, and some other important cities telling us what poverty is. I think Latin America and our children deserve much more than that. I agree. I agree. Well, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Well, count with me. Um, and if you need my contact details, Clarice and Bani and all the others, they have my contact details. It would be okay. a pleasure to work with Let's you. Get in touch. We have a Thanks. comment from my Michal uh, Apollo. Um, I appreciate the presentation of Rodrigo and Daniela. What usually happened in my case, in his case, Michal, when he tried to explain to a wider audience, ordinary people, about the consequence of global climate change, he's usually hearing this is impossible uh, to what you said. Perhaps the same is with poverty. What you and Jorge just have said is difficult to understand, even to some of us. To understand it, to understand it we need to see it and feel it. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I think that's empathy. This is something very important. No, we, uh, I, I have recently uh, watched a, a video of a very known star architect. He is, uh, his name is Rem Kuhas from Omar, 
metropolitan office uh, of architecture and he's known very known in our field and and he did through harvard university a study in lagos in the city of lagos and one of one video uh, he he states he says something very interesting he said that his experience in the field uh, obliged him to develop uh, empathy and recognize uh, his own uh, his own uh, humanity uh, yeah no his own uh, lack of uh, sensibility to that before getting it at really before having the experience that uh, would allow him to have the empathy because uh, while this is just numbers of uh, what we read and, and then uh, we are insensible to that we became insensible we have numbers I mean, the number of children that die before completing six years old in the yearly uh, in, in the world is around six million children. So this, if we just listen to this figure, it's so absurd. But if we really realized it, we wouldn't be doing anything else but trying to address that and do something in all fields of, of knowledge. So the, the idea is uh, and to, to be build certain, empathy. We don't have the answers to ask other specialists as well. We need to work in collaboration. Bruna's mentioned this, Douglas mentioned this. We come to an agreement. We need to work in collaboration, stop our podiums. We are not anymore because we are academics and we don't have all the answers. Start working together with people, for people, rather than telling people what to do. People are not stupid. People okay. need simply to have, you know, someone to guide them. And I think that's our mission here, to simply offer what we can offer from an architecture perspective, from a lawyer's perspective, from all our perspective, working together. Exactly. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you very, very much. It was a, a very inspirational presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. No, thank you for joining us. And let me see now we have Rodrigo again. Are we okay to move on to the next presentation? Yeah, thank you, Daniela. Obrigado. Thank I know. You. Bye bye. Bye bye. For now. Uh, For we're now. going to have now Ana Gabriela Godinho Lima and Rodrigo again, uh, Mindlin Loeb from Mackenzie, again, Presbyterian University in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, they are going to talk now about women and children in vulnerable urban territories the contingent most affected by climate changes. Ah, so we have a Mihal here, climate change as well. Uh, so thank you again, um, Rodrigo. I think you are going to start now. Yes, yes. Uh, your, your floor, again, same, 20 minutes roughly for the presentation, and then this is our last presentation. We'll open to questions and answers like before. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, Anna Gabriela uh, couldn't be here because she had uh, something that she couldn't uh, B, so she says hello to everybody, and I'm going to present. This is part of uh, our research work that we have been uh, developing since 2016 uh, in a project we called City, Gender, and Early Childhood. And we had the support of Bernard Van Lier Foundation, which is a foundation in the Netherlands that work already for 50 years with early childhoods. Uh, in many aspects, and they have opened uh, a sector of their actions called Urban 95, where they address the conditions of early childhood in the urban environment. So these uh, activities were, we were been, uh, having in several territories uh, in Sao Paulo, uh, Parelheiros in the south, uh, Jardim La Pena in the east, uh, well, Favela do Moinho was part of this uh, also activity downtown uh, and, and also uh, the occupation of buildings in, in the center of the city and many other conditions. And one thing that uh, became very clear in the process of uh, reading, studying, talking to people, observing the conditions uh, is that women and children are the contingent most vulnerable and most affected by climate change uh, in the cities. So we, we have, where women account for 75% of the world's pu poor people, uh, so they are 
the most uh, contingent of, of people that are living in poverty. Children under 14 represent 25% of the population in vulnerable territories also. Children are a very significant number in this situation. And in Brazil in 2015, of the 10.3 the million Brazilian children and the four, 83.6 had a woman as a main responsible of care, mainly between 18 and 29 year age. So usually also the, the time dedicated to the care of children uh, is mainly responsibility of uh, women. Uh, the impact of climate, climate change on the vulnerability of informal urban territories. So we have uh, increasing situation of women vulnerabilities in the city uh, due to climate change induced largely by urban activities. So we have very high impact of uh, urban mobility active mobility, uh, pollution, cars, accidents, one of the main uh, cause of casualties of children in the city of Sao Paulo uh, and in Brazil is uh, by car accidents, so it's very uh, bad situation. Uh, cities consume 60 to 80 percent of global energy and natural resources, being responsible for approximately 70 percent of CO2 emissions. So we have a, a very high level of emissions in cities. Uh, and also these territories are uh, uh, sensible to extreme weather conditions, so the rain, uh, and also the, the conditions of the occupation of the territory regarding uh, the care of the direction of the water of the rains and the floods and, and other uh, very severe conditions that they are vulnerable to. And they are more vulnerable because they have other, uh, as we said before, the multidimensional vulnerability puts them in a very sensitive uh, situation. So the characterization of the vulnerability of women and children in, in, in vulnerable urban territories, the urban territories, they grow faster than the formal territories in the cities. Uh, women are more exposed to violence uh, in these vulnerable urban territories as there is uh, very little control social control and, and, and support of institutions and and women take the the charge uh, the main charge for the non uh, paid uh, services as taking care of children the elderly and to take care of the people uh, in brazil three in each single mothers live under the poverty line so this is very uh, important uh, condition because uh, there are many, many single mothers. So what happens to uh, men and fathers in this condition? We have a, 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 the, a very, the challenge of the paternity uh, is, is very important to be addressed. 40% of children under 14 live under the poverty line and 60% of black children live in poverty and among them 20% in extreme poverty then there's another layer here which is the racial layer in Brazil which is very severe as well. So the, the interrelationships between environmental issues and the conditions of women and children in vulnerable territories Vulnerability depends on exposure to the negative effects of climate variability and the capacity to avoid these effects or cope with them. This capacity depends on income, assets, education and knowledge, and here there is a gender bias. So we have uh, all this uh, uh, condition that uh, contributes for leaving women and children in an extreme vulnerable situation. Environmental changes are being accompanied by increasing in incidence of extreme weather events far outside the average of bioclimatic regions in their intensity and occurrence. So this is a concern. No, we, we're going to he, have more of these extreme events uh, in terms of intensity and in terms of incidence. Uh, 
then we have the relations uh, oh, sorry uh, it's better between cities environment and gender uh, and and the work we have been taking students and, and visiting and accompanying the work of the early childhood excellence center which is uh, IBEAC, is an institute uh, of Sao Paulo and CPCD, Vera Lyon and Tian Rocha, with the support of uh, other organizations such as Bernard Van Lee Foundation and, and others. Yeah, they have been doing already for 10 years a work of empowerment uh, of the, which they call the young women leaders. Uh, and they have uh, set up uh, an early childhood excellence center they have the Vargin Grandi Healthy Community, so they are talking about uh, food, they are talking about so the services of, of uh, food of, to the community and, and of the environment, the house to tell stories, the Kitchen Amar, which is a, an entrepreneurship with the women that they cook and they provide services of food, uh, as requested, and they adopted streets, streets where children can play and the community organized to uh, not to allow the circulation of cars during the time the children are playing. And also they called uh, an initiative from Minas Gerais, which is called Architecture in the Periphery, and women train other women to uh, perform the construction work to improve the environmental quality of their uh, houses. So this is a group of actions that are being uh, held for already many years and they have a very positive impact and the building up of strengthening that community. Uh, so this project started from mapping the main points of vulnerability in terms of social, economic, and gender inequalities, such as violence and its insufficient urban and service infrastructure, prioritizing prevention and mitigation of precarious condition. They focused on improving women mobility, education, income options, and childcare alternatives. The results were the empowerment of women groups who are now applying and disseminating the gain knowledge. So the, the organization of that work allowed these women to multiply their knowledge. And we are now at the moment, we are developing uh, with a group of women uh, specific uh, design of furniture for the conditions of uh, their houses and to give support to the care of children and baby. Another important thing, just to, uh, uh, as a remark, uh, the halfway house is a house because in this community, pregnant women would have to wait for a bus that would not come very often, and they would take around two to three hours to get to the hospital, the nearest hospital, and many times they would get there and the doctor would say, okay, we're, you're not ready yet, go back home. So maybe this would happen at the end of the day. Many women would spend uh, overnight sitting in the sidewalk, waiting to, to be again ready to the hospital. So the organization rented the house near the maternity, the hospital, and then when that happens, women go there, wait, they have a place to eat, to sleep, and to be taken care of. So this, uh, all these actions uh, are linked with some very uh, important uh, strategy, with, which is the ethics of care, uh, the ethics of taking care of uh, the girls, of taking care of the environment, uh, taking care of the relationships. So, so this uh, is a very interesting uh, strategy to cope with the uh, challenges of the increasing vulnerability due to uh, climate change and, and impact on the environment that would make even more uh, difficult the situation of uh, women and children. 
Uh, with that, I conclude uh, our thoughts uh, about this uh, work and hopefully you have questions and comments as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much again, Rodrigo. Obrigado. And I don't know if, um, if you can can cancel the share. If we have any comment or questions, in, in the meantime, it's what you are saying. You know, I have a few comments, one directly linked to you know, my work. Um, the Fundasao, um, we had a register from Disque 100, uh, dial 100. And uh, back in 2019, we had uh, uh, 17,000 cases uh, registered of um, sexual violence against children. That was 2019, 17,000. Back April this year, 2020, only April this year, Disque 100 had already almost 20,000. Almost, you know, uh, it was already an increase of 47% of cases in comparison to the year before and it's growing exponentially because of the pandemic. So what you are describing in terms of women, it's replicated in terms of children as, as well. Uh, so thank you very, very much. Um, probably a question to you, um, because we haven't talked so far uh, about this, you know, vulnerable territories and vulnerable people related to climate change. What is the situation with indigenous populations in, in Brazil, if, if you have any knowledge about it? Because again, I'm aware of part of the story because of the Fundação, but I, I don't really have much information about indigenous populations in Brazil because they are certainly very affected by climate change and the multinationals in the Amazonia. Uh, well, good, good question. We, we have different uh, indigenous uh, communities in Brazil. We have those that are uh, reminiscent of uh, indigenous populations near the city. In Sao Paulo, we have uh, uh, indigenous community near Pico do Jaraguá. They have trouble with land. They have uh, several difficult situations due to the pressure of uh, development of uh, construction, civil construction in the market. And we have the indigenous communities that uh, live in the, the Amazon area no, to the north. Uh, and they are uh, struggling now because we have been uh, uh, watching the the destruction of the services of control and and of uh, support to the respect of their uh, areas so they have there are many invasions of uh, uh, mining people that want to, to explore the, the territory. So there is a contamination of the water rivers and other kind of uh, violences. And in terms of uh, the climate change, we have uh, the droughts are um, a bit more severe. It impacts on the production of food and, and also the fires that also we have the natural, uh, not so natural fires because they are getting more severe due to the climate change and also the criminal fires that are very high. So I'd say that we have a very delicate situation and needs to be urgently addressed. People are mobilizing themselves, but we see not very good perspective under this actual government. Hopefully we can see a change in two Once years. again, I couldn't agree more. And once again, I don't think it's wishful thinking. We cannot wait for Bolsonaro or any other um, uh, government. I think it's up to us. That is why I was asking about women. It's intentional about black people, about children or crianças, and about indigenous population, because it is up to us to do something about it. If we wait for Bolsonaro or any other, Lula mentioned them. I, 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 I'm okay with any of them. I don't think that's the, 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 the solution, but thank you, Rodrigo. I don't know if we do have more questions. However, I know Clarice, Clarice, are you there? I think Clarice wants to say something. Clarice? Yes, can you ah, hear hello. me? Hello, Benvinda, Clarice. <laughs> hello, George. How are you? <laughs> Good, your floor so, now. Hello, what, Rodrigo. What ask or say? <laughs> Uh, my question is actually it's about a little bit about the two panels, last panels. 
I would like to know uh, if Rodrigo and if uh, Andre, um, sorry, is it Andrea? Daniela. Uh, Daniela, sorry. <laughs> and Daniela, what do you think? Do you think these initiatives should, and if so, do you think they could inspire public policies or governmental programs? If you think so, what would be the, the main advantages of that, the main obstacles and the potential impacts? What do you think about uh, getting a larger scale in, uh, in these kind of initiatives? Do you think it is possible? Do you think it's desirable? This is my question. Okay, uh, Daniela, do you want to start? Can I start? Um, well, um, I think that somehow uh, there's a movement that I've been uh, taking part in Sao Paulo that is just beginning. It's called Pacto Pela Cidade Justas, which is basically a getting together of uh, just initiatives, uh, different NGOs, and also uh, through our school, through INSPER, another university in Sao Paulo, and basically, we are just donating a series of uh, projects and actually trying to help developing uh, public policies. It's just, there's a, we just signed, it's called Term of Donation. Of a, it's a group of people get, getting together, trying to change public policies. So basically, um, I'm not, uh, in this community, in this group, I'm not dealing with this particular slum, but it's a, it's looking into different territories of Sao Paulo. And we believe that through this uh, group of people, we kind of, uh, we are, we are, we're gonna be able to develop something new that could be replicated in different parts of Brazil. It's just, uh, you know, it's just an initiative that is beginning this year, but it's aiming at uh, changing in this, in, in a, reaching a wider uh, impact because if we deal only with one community it's too small what we do so we have to gain knowledge from this specific uh, work that we do in different small communities and we are trying to 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 get some knowledge of this particular works we've been doing getting together as a big group and donating it this to uh, the municipality. So I, I see some changes. I see some things uh, happening. And if anybody's interested, just search Pacto Pela Cidade Justas, and you're going to learn a lot of what we've been doing lately. And if I may add, Daniela, you get a louder voice. By having more people, more collaboration, you are louder. And then politicians start paying attention, and then you may end up with a change in policy. Yes. Single yeah. mind, it's very difficult to make a change, but you know, as a group, you know, collaboration, you get a louder voice. Yes, that's what we believe. Completely, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think we have someone else, Anat. Anat, are you there? I think we have yeah. another comment or question. Where are you? Okay. Yeah. Let me just add, uh, add Rodrigo, a comment. Sorry. Rodrigo, before Anat, sorry. sorry Anat, we have uh, because Clarice made a very nice uh, uh, question, no? and it's a very challenging question to be answered, because we have been so many, uh, have seen so many uh, initiatives that uh, try to get into public policy, uh, and then suddenly inside the structure of uh, gov the government, uh, things do not happen. We have very, uh, the, the, the political system needs to be addressed in a more critical way. And in, in the terms of a city like Sao Paulo, you know, if, if you don't have a transactorial approach, I mean, we, you, you cannot just, uh, the, the urban uh, development company needs to work together with assistance, social assistance, with uh, health, with education. So we need transactorial agenda. And the transactorial agenda needs to find common ground. They need to understand that they are not concurrent. And as the system of political organization today, they are concurrent because they have, uh, I mean, the, each secretary is held to a different party that took part in the campaign. And, and many times that 
uh, puts us in a, in a very critical situation because you cannot find common ground. So I think this is one point. The other point that I think is that we have many uh, strong, uh, popular, uh, from the ground up organizations. So I would say that maybe we need more civil disobedience. Yeah, we need more uh, pressure of the people that live under these conditions really to do, because many times the agenda of people that come to the territory uh, with a sense of uh, power in terms of economic power and uh, formal knowledge, they try to impose a solution they find better for the people that are there. Many times they can bring good things, can bring improvements, but many times uh, they do not listen to really what people want. And while they do not listen, they don't recognize knowledge there. And if they don't recognize knowledge there, what they are, they are doing is just reproducing uh, the colonization process, you now local. And, and, and many times they have more uh, to get than to give. So this, this is very delicate. So I think we need to mix you know, a bit of civil disobedience uh, with some uh, change in the political system. What we said before with Daniela, bottom-up action. Completely, yes. completely agree. Bottom -up. The idea may come from the you know, top-down, but we definitely need to a bottom-up action. If not, we will be always having imposed ideas from abroad or from our leaders in Latin America. Yeah, we need definitely bottom up. Uh, I, um, we have very a few more minutes. Um, and Anat, are you there? If you want to ask any questions, because we have only four or five minutes. Yes, Anat? Yeah, I'm here. Thanks. Thanks so much. This has been fascinating, as was the um, session before that I was moderating. And what you started talking about, Jorge, a few minutes ago, quite a few minutes ago, and now you've even uh, reinforced it by talking about bottom up. I want to take it one step further. This idea of um, being very local and of being intensely focused on our own issues. I, I go to all these conferences, I talk to people, and my personal interest, for instance, is in Palestine. Um, we've done this whole conference here, and I don't think we had one article or one um, contribution about Palestine, whereas my whole life, what you call civil disobedience, what you call local work, bottom up, has all been in Palestine. But I'm worried about the connection. And I'm, I'm not saying this at all as detrimental. I'm just worried about this feeling of being alone or isolated in a certain issue, working on something, meeting people at conferences, of course, uh, perhaps in some NGOs, but not really working together on things. And I'm wondering if local bottom-up civil disobedience can be strong enough. I know I'm sounding too theoretical, but there's something about the international or the global that has to give us some strength. So I'm wondering what you'd think about that. I mean, it's wonderful to hear you and I'm willing are you asking to me? Pardon me? Are you asking me? Sorry, I'm not. Are you, are you... I'm asking Rodrigo and you actually, yes. Okay, Rodrigo, you want to start and then I can, because you are the speaker, so I don't mind answering, but you are the speaker, you're not happy to answer. And actually Daniela too, because Daniela, what you said also was very touching. And yeah, I, I thought, yeah, oh, yeah. this is what my friends in Palestine are doing in this and that project. But I then work how, how do we get the projects together? I have an answer to that, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, very good, very good point and provocation. I think that uh, bottom-up and, and civil disobedience can be very strong, uh, but we need to, many of us which are not in the conditions they live, need to get into the movement. We need to be there together and we need to be disobedient in terms of uh, the, the structure of uh, the places where we act, where, where we have uh, the possibility of developing work. And this kind of disobedience also is very challenging because it, it may create uh, reactions. Uh, we wouldn't expect very nice uh, reactions. Uh, and, and I think that uh, 
how do we do that? I mean, we need, for instance, that the idea of having, we have in Brazil very strong organizations, private organizations and NGOs that are very powerful. This movement that Daniela mentioned uh, has very powerful organizations. And in, in my perspective, they, they could uh, be more uh, linked to the social movements, to the popular movements. So we need to break the chain of this uh, inequality. I mean, we have a very high level of inequality that puts people uh, in a position. So we need to understand how do we break that. And one of ways to break that, in Brazil now there is a very uh, discussion about uh, the, 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 the tax over fortunes and the tax, the, the, the improvement of taxation of, of people that have more income. And, and this is, and they're talking about 1.5% of tax uh, of the bigger fortunes in Brazil. The, 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 that value would be able to cover the value of the Bolsa Familia program for a year. So just 1.5%. And this seems very high for the people that have their money and so much concentrated. So how do we change that? You know? uh, because we, we have now come to a point where it's uh, not sustainable or not interesting. No, we are all uh, being uh, achieved by this situation in several levels. So we cannot... People, as people are now preparing themselves to go to Mars, you know, that, that, that's the idea. So, but the people need to understand that very few will be able to, you know, very, very few and the very, very billionaires. So some of the billionaires, they need to, to open their minds. I think that's, that's a challenge. Uh, so coming back and not answering your question, but I think that uh, we need to get closer to the social movements, to the bottom-up movements. We need to understand that uh, disobedience, uh, the civil disobedience is related to the lack of access, to the lack of rights that are not being provided by those who could and should be taking the actions to do so. Uh, and, and most of the people that work in that kind of movement, they are inside the system. They work in social assistance, uh, health, people, education, they are very strong. So I, I believe that we should uh, strengthen these networks and create a, a dialogue with the stronger and global organizations that need to understand that uh, if they do not act, they will not be able to fly away as well. Daniela, very briefly, because we are already over the time, so if you want to reply very, thank you very much, Rodrigo. If you want to reply to Anat, and then I'll finish. Um, is that okay, Daniela? Sure. Uh, well, I, I, I like to hear what Anat said, and I believe that uh, we need to expand, to exchange knowledge. For example, uh, I've been looking a lot into uh, all the initiatives in, in, within Latin America because we have a very uh, similar condition in terms of poverty. When we say poverty in Brazil, it's a different poverty in terms of lacks of what people really need. I'm talking when we compare to more developed countries. Of course, there's poverty everywhere, but the inequality we have in Brazil is similar to inequality in Colombia, in Peru, and um, many Latin American countries. But also, it's very similar to India or to other uh, Asian countries. So I believe that we definitely need to, to exchange much more uh, initiatives so we can gain knowledge of how to deal with inequality in different places of the world where uh, social inequality is so strong that defines the way uh, we live. Basically, we Brazilians uh, 
this defines us in terms of how we are seen by the world. The, the, the images of slums in Rio de Janeiro are as famous as the beautiful beaches in Copacabana or Ipanema. So Brazilians, we are famous for football, for soccer, for uh, beautiful beaches and for the favelas. So two of these images are very impressive and very beautiful, but how do we change the situation, not only in pictures, but also from inside out? Uh, there's a lot, as you study the favelas in Brazil and also favelas similar to ours favelas, there's a lot to learn from uh, local initiatives, from uh, people inside really, that really matter to their community. So how do we empower these people so that uh, with them, with the knowledge we have, we are the specialists, but we don't know the territories, we don't know what they really, really need from inside. So how do we work together? So basically, this is what we can exchange. And this is what I'm, I'm personally, I'm very, I'm very interested in looking at. So whatever knowledge I can gain from this conference and from uh, studying, I'm totally open to share because I think that's the only way we can start transforming our realities. Perfect. Thank you very much, Daniela. And I'll finish very briefly, Anat, and then I can send my details. My details are with Clarice and all the organizing team. But um, sorry, uh, here Guilherme and uh, Amanda, I'm going to take two more minutes and then we'll, we'll be done. But I, I have to answer to Anat. Um, to me, again, it's top down and bottom up. What do I mean by this? Top down, we need the specialists from all over the world like we are. And not the big name, not the big institutions. People like us willing to work for free. I don't believe in charging for our services in this kind of thing. So that's why I changed my logos and I only represent the institutions I believe in this institution in Brazil. I am not part of ASAP UK uh, anymore because of different reasons. One of them being, you know, transparency. I want transparent things and I want to belong to a transparent organization, which I know my foundation in Brazil, it's very clear where the money is going to and where the money is going from because that's what I ask from my government. Yes, I want to see things online. I want to have public access. So one of the things I propose and I challenge all of us specialists to ask for all our organization is complete transparency. Not because I'm Latin American, I'm, I'm corrupt. Yes, I'm Latin American, I'm going to teach you how to do things. And we want transparency. We offer transparency. I'm not going to put my name in any other organization if they don't offer transparency because I represent myself and my own brand. So that, that's, you know, top down, you know, to uh, work ourselves from the resources we have. I'm talking as well financial. Uh, I have a good enough salary, so the rest it's sent to Brazil. First because I'm Latin and then Argentinian. In, it's a little or uh, the fees from my, the royalties from my books. I send them to Brazil. I don't need more money. I have enough. And I'm not being a communist here. I'm simply applying common sense. Um, then to accept as academics, we don't have all the answers. Uh, I have certain answers in law and public international law. And I have a specialist in Palestine, uh, representing Palestine in Israel. One of my chapters, my latest book, uh, talks about Middle East and that particular issue, as well as Kashmir, South China Sea in Asia, uh, North, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, Crimea, and so on in Europe, the Americas, the border between Mexico and US, Amazonia, Antarctica, name them. But I had to ask uh, specialist knowledge. I ask people like Clarice and Daniel in Brazil. I ask people in the foundation. So I ask the know-how. And that brings me to the second point, um, bottom up. We need to work with people. We don't have a podium. We are not more than them because we have a degree. I have seven degrees, I always tell my students. That doesn't make me a better person. It makes me some, someone very patient. Most of my education has been for free. Um, back in Argentina. I only paid when I came to this country, the UK for education. I believe in state education, in free education. So coming back to that, my way of paying back is going there and teaching in these classrooms for free. Uh, again, of course I need money, I, you know, finances and so on, and I look for opportunities. But again, uh, I don't wait for Donald Trump, Boris Johnson or Bolsonaro to make a change. I am the change, and I mean that. Uh, and I dare all of us to do the same. And finally, if the group doesn't exist, create your group. Uh, luckily, with some of my colleagues, five, six years ago, we created a group in the UK. Two Latin Americans, a Venezuelan lady and myself, we started, uh, she's now in Surrey, uh, Jurich North. 
the condition we all do everything for free and we share all the presentation for free globally. Um, so that's one of the conditions. We don't apply any fee for our um, events. We ask people if we used to have face-to-face -face presentation to pay themselves or their institutions. We don't pay them to come to Manchester, Durham or Surrey. So again, I think it has to do with bringing a, a, a change and we have to bring the change. Um, I don't think it's wishful thinking, it's again, Top down, we need people like here, we have Thomas. Uh, people like Thomas Pogge, you know, intellectually very solid, but well, we need as well people like the foundation that work with children, work with poverty. Because right now, although Shusha Meneghel, one of the richest person in Brazil created the foundation, the, the actual president was from the street. Shusha selected the current president, Vinicius, who is one of my friends, he used to live on the streets. I'm very proudly that guy now, he used to be part of one of the many um, things they used to run at the foundation. He's now the president of that Fundasau. With his wife, he met his wife in that Fundasau. He could have been dead. He could have been a prostitute. He could have been dealing drugs. He's now the president of the foundation I represent. Uh, so coming back to you, Anat, uh, I think again, that's what, it's not top down, it's not bottom up, it's both of them local, regional, and international level. Um, I, I'm, hope, I'm trying to be succinct because I am very conscious about you know, the, the time. One last thing I wanted to say, thank you all the speakers. Obrigado Bruna, Douglas, Rodrigo and Daniela. Thank you all the attendees. And in particular, many thanks to Clarice, Bania, Amanda, Guilherme for all the organization because it's been a pleasure for all of us. Uh, and I'm thank you. We keep on working together because that's the secret of our success, working together. Thank you very much and let's make a change. It is up to us. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you very much, Jorge. You were wonderful there too. Thank you for everybody. Obrigado. And see you soon. <laughs> Obrigado. See you. Everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Anat. I hope I answered. If not, ask Clarice, she has my yeah. contact details. Yeah, no, you, you answered and you won.